welcome to our continuing discussion on the future of English language teaching. This series of interviews with representatives from across the ALT profession explores how the coronavirus pandemic is changing the way we teach, learn and develop professionally. Each week, Transform ELT is releasing a recorded discussion that explores different aspects of the impact on our profession on YouTube, through our Facebook page and on our website. We invite comments, critiques and further questions that we can feed into future interviews, so please do contribute. Today, I'm talking to Chris Graham. He's an independent consultant working out of the UK but around the world in fragile and post-conflict contexts. He's also the co-founder of ELT Footprint. So Chris, how did ELT Footprint begin and what's its role? Well, that's, that, that's a question. It's been around now for about 15 months. It was May last year, 2019, that, we, uh, that, that, that it all began. And it was at the Innovate Conference in Barcelona. And... Um, uh, Dan Barber, uh, Danny Barber, who's one of the four founders, he made a, a, a really excellent uh, plenary talk about the environment and about ELT and the environment. And, and uh, I would say he kicked down quite a few doors and made a lot of people think, oh, well, this is interesting. Um, this is really interesting. And he, he declared an ELT a climate emergency. And this was the title bit. And um, a lot of people, including me, in the audience thought this is, this is really interesting. So I, I went home and I wrote a blog. A little bit of a blog it was something about project-based learning and stuff you can use in the classroom and get the kids out and doing something practical like cleaning the beach and then coming up and making some posters in class and trying to get that linkage between between class and uh, and environmental challenges so i wrote that a couple of other people wrote, wrote blogs and bits and pieces and then four of us just started talking I thought well let, let's let's make a facebook group and see what happens which we did and we've now got over three thousand members um we have a fairly busy uh, website, uh, which has, is, is becoming a repository of ideas and information. If you go there, teachers go there, they can find lesson plans around environmental topics. We are developing a set of guidance or ideas for conference organizers, people who are, who are concerned about the footprint of, of, of their ELT or any kind of conference. There's ideas there. There's stuff around greening language schools, private language schools, but that could also be applied to, you know, to government schools as well in, in a different way, private and uh, primary and secondary schools abroad. So that's become a kind of central, hopefully it's becoming, I should say, a central resource where people can go and take take ideas, take them to classes. And we also try to spread the word through conferences, um, international conferences and regional local conferences to try and try and engage. And the the uptake has been absolutely staggering. Um, I don't I don't think we ever said however many people we think would join get involved, but it's 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 gone bonkers actually. As, 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 I don't quite know what it is anymore. But it certainly raised awareness and I'm happy with that. How many people are involved in this and how do you count them? Well, we have, there are four core founder members, which I'm one, and then we have, uh, there's three or four others who work with us running the Facebook page, because obviously that, that's something that needs to be moderated and, and admitting members and dealing with the occasional questionable post. Um, and then other people, a lot of it is, um, it's quite decentralised. We'll often hear that a teacher from I know, Guatemala will write and say, this is what we, we've been doing in our school. And we say, would you be willing to share, write a blog, share some, of course I will. And so the stuff going on in, in the field, as it were, that we're not necessarily aware, but that's great. And I'm not necessarily saying we would take any credit for the instigation of that. But it, it, it's, it, it's, to me, it's excellent that a teacher in Guatemala lesson plan about um, some aspect of environmental education can be picked up by a teacher in Moscow and they can pick it up and, and, and put, it, put it into their classroom. So um, it's, it's, it's a combination, I mean, our role, I suppose, of the founders is just trying to organise information and give a structure, but it's becoming more and more grassroots. It, 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 we still need to do work. We need to get further into developing countries and to, to get awareness there, get messages out and get communication, but it's beginning to happen. So um, it's been a really interesting experience and um, very satisfying. And so how many people are involved and in, how many people total are signed up for the Facebook group, for example? Uh, just over 3,000. Um, that is quite a large number. I think three, three, nearly three thousand one hundred. As this morning, I checked. Yeah. So that, that, and that, given that we've been at it for fifteen months, that's mm. that's good. And we have a lot of other people who are not, possibly quite sensibly, who are not on Facebook, who are also involved in other initiatives too. Um, we also, we, we, we write, we blog. Um, 
Dan has just done, done something in, in the newsletter for the special, the um, uh, global interests that seek for ITEF also, he, he's, he's got, got an article in there. So we're trying to uh, plug into um, TEFL ELT organizations around the world, not, not to, uh, uh, w w we're not lobbyists, I always make that very clear. We're, we're, what we want to be is people who will say, well, have you spoken to him? Because uh, he did one of those last month and he can help you and, and somebody goes off and, and synergy is created. I think it's important to say we're not lobbyists in that sense. So it's like an information sharing network that's raising awareness Basically, about environmental absolutely. issues in English language. That's exactly what it is, yeah. And, and, and I, I think the awareness was there before in my own journey. I, I knew there were things that, but I knew that we all fly quite a lot and we have a lot of single use paper and all that. It sort of it was in the back of my mind, but then I think a lot of people say, yeah, it, it brings it all together. I was just going to ask you that. What do you see as the, the main environmental issues in English language teaching? Well, I suppose it's fair for uh, one of them is the one I just did is, is, is flying. I mean, well, yeah. the, the, the study abroad thing, and this, this is very much uh, of the moment now with, with COVID and, and, and the effects that's having about the study abroad market. But, you know, a lot of students fly to a lot of places around the world to develop their English, whether they come into the UK, or going to Australia, to wherever, wherever they go to, there, there are a lot of flights. So there's, there's that, and there are a lot of us, and you and me and others in, in our line of business and publishers and people, uh, examin examiners, um, who, do, who, who do burn a lot of air miles. And um, I'm not saying we shouldn't necessarily be doing that at all, but I'm saying that's something we need to, to factor in to think about. So there's that. Um, another impact is, is single use paper um and interestingly now everything is everything things are shifting online we're going away from uh, paper books as it were to, towards <laughs> online delivery um the publishers are, are desperately trying to catch up I, th I think my sense from publishing is there's been a well of course we're gonna we're gonna go digital but but just not yet and then they wake up in the morning and think ah now how's the day so there's a lot of catching up to do <laughs> So that's an opportunity, but but yeah, you and I know there's a lot there's a lot of paper wastage or single use books. The, the, the student has the book for what an eighty hour course, fills in all the boxes, takes it home, puts it in the cupboard, and never sees it again. Um, so I think I think that is an issue. Um, of course, the big international conferences again. There's flying to and from the conferences, but also the huge conference centres have a, a, a considerable environmental impact. Whether it's 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 from the cups we drink our coffee out of to um, uh, the heating and cooling, depend, depending where the building is. Um, again, I'm not saying international conferences are finished, are gone. Um, but I'm well, saying we need to consider, we need, we, we need to think about ways of managing. Again, uh, our friend COVID has come along and kicked that one as well. Hasn't mm, it? So. Well, considering the number of online conferences that have been recently, mm. I think there's going to be a huge place for face-to-face -face conferences because the online ones aren't that great. <laughs> They're <laughs> hard. I mean, yeah, you're right. I know. I as much out of them as, as I did from the face-to-face -face conferences with the, the networking and the bumping into people, being introduced mm. to people in the corridor. Well, That's what I go to conferences for, not necessarily for the person. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, for me, it's a freelance, it's, it's a network thing. It's, it's a place that you meet people, you see your mates, so you only see once every other year or so, whatever it is. And it's, it's all that stuff. Um, and I, I, I did a conference last week online, in, in Oman online. And yeah, it's not the same thing. And first of all, I, I had no idea how many people were in the room. Probably nobody. I don't know. Um, so it's... At the moment, I, I think the question, the interesting question around COVID is, is going to be, if the big conferences do go and continue next year, how many people will actually want to go? Well, yes, there is that too. There's a thinking of your personal safety and whether you're going to be yeah. comfortable around that many people yeah. in an enclosed environment. Yeah, yeah it's, going to be, it's just going to depend on how the, the pandemic pans out, really, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think another thing that, that, that I'm enthusiastic about is, is the local and regional conference model. Um, you know, mm. where, where, where there is less travel, or it may be train travel or road travel or something like that. And there's no doubt. I mean, I, I, I'm a fan of it. I, I love it. I, four days at ITF or whatever, it's, it's wonderful. But when you, you know as well as I do, you get to a local or regional or national conference, there seems to be a much greater relevance of what's going on as well. Mm. Because many of the people providing input are within that system or from a similar similar system in, in a bordering country or something like that. And and I'm not saying that doesn't happen at large conferences. And sometimes being taken out of your comfort zone is exactly what teachers need. I think we all need that sometimes. But um, 
I think we will see a focus towards the, the, the smaller scale regional national conferences, perhaps with the international speakers that are coming in as we are now on Zoom or on, on, or on Microsoft Teams or whatever. I think that might be the model more and more. Yeah, are there any other um, potential impacts of the COVID situation on the ELT community? I think there's a lot. Um, and I think we're seeing, I mean, the, the big one, of course, has been the rush, the rush online, um, which, uh, uh, yeah, as I said with the publishers, we, got, we woke up in the morning and thought, ah, we've got to do this. We've been talking Emergency about it for ages, but I've, online, yeah, yeah, I've actually got to do it now. So, I mean, my own feeling is that we're, I don't think we're getting it right yet. We're getting there, but we're, we're learning as much as the students are learning, I think. Um, but we will get there. We will get to I think to it's going to be a while get, before we get to the yeah. point with what we're doing, actually. I think that's uh, yeah. because of the pressure. And now we, we, there's no chance to iterate, really. There's no chance to, to retry, improve until You've next year. You've got to do it. You've got to get on with it. And, and, and so, I mean, having said but I, I think one of the legacies will be, I, I think students will get in the habit fairly quickly. If you go to private language schools, in, I don't know, Spain or Italy or France or somewhere like that, um, if you're a, a student or a, an adult who's busy with work life and private life and stuff, the opportunity to have, say, half as every English course, whether six hours a week, four hours a week, whatever it is, to do half at home in, when you want to mm. and half in, in you know, fixed school time, that might be quite appealing. If we, if we get it, I, I, I have a feeling people will, well, I think we're probably over the worst of it now. We're over the worst of teachers, you know, who don't know how to switch the microphone on or all this sort of stuff. I think we're probably most of us are through that now. I've been there. I'm sure yeah, we've all been through that. I think students will think, yeah, this is actually okay. I mean, because I think the other issue is that we stay with a private line. I would say, I would agree with you if it's <laughs> done reasonably well. Yeah, big if. But if it's not done well, the kids are complete. I, I have, there are examples of kids in the UK, um, friends of, of mine who have kids mm. who are really complaining about the quality of instruction that they're getting from their mm. state schools in the UK because it is uh, it's more like a correspondence course it's like here's the reading list read that then do this exercise this test and Absolutely. email it to me and that's not good online teaching but I'd, I'd like to think that ELT people are making progress that we are getting better there's an interesting survey that the British Council just brought out, and I'll, I'll provide a link to that later on, on um, how people are behaving within uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, COVID Insights is the name mm. of the report. And it says there that English teachers are actually more likely to use technology and are using technology with their students um, more mm. often. So uh, I, I think you're right in that assertion. I think we're, 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 we're because it's not entirely new i mean you, if you, we, a lot of teachers have mm -hmm. been playing with bits and pieces of tech albeit in class face to face rather than, than it's, it's not entirely new we're we're used to us a lot of people are used to smart boards they're used to, to, to using youtube whatever in the class so i, I think we'll adapt and but but I, but as i say we might be forced to partly by student demand but also going back to private language school in italy for example if they have got to have social distancing in their classes they, they may well have to, back to the conversation we had earlier about restaurants, they may well have to cut their class sizes in half. So either means you need twice yes. as many rooms or twice as many hours, or you do half at home. So I think it's here to stay. Um, mm. It's going to vary. I, I think the private language school is one thing, but, but how um, ministries around the world uh, tackle this is going to be really interesting. I mean, certain countries are, already have excellent IT infrastructure and they're, they're probably oven ready. But there are a number of locations around where the infrastructure is not strong and they're going to be looking for solutions. Um, and no, it's going to be very challenging yeah. for them. No, I think that, that um, IT infrastructure is a big issue, but also um, I, I was talking to Sherry Leibert last week mm. and in the States, um, they had a shortage of computers and uh, facilities mm. available for students to be able to use at home. Um, they didn't. They they personally didn't have them because they were in a certain certain socioeconomic brackets mm. that they couldn't afford them. And uh, that's the same in the UK. I know they're having yeah. this problem here. There, there's a huge program of um, funding provision of laptops. Laptop for every child, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, to, yeah. yeah. To, to, it's to, digital to, divide. It's a real thing, isn't it? 
Well, I think that is on the way to being redressed somewhat by the funding that yeah. people are putting into this technology provision at the moment. Yeah, so, so, but how that's panning out in developing countries, I don't know. I mean, because yeah, there, there it's, it's beyond having just a, a laptop. It's actually having the infrastructure the, the, to use. And as I mentioned, the project I was involved in before yeah. uh, uh, during lockdown was 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 um, decision to, to to use recorded lessons and to transmit them to the national TV network because that was a way to get into basically every child's house it's a very um, imperfect way yeah but it's better than having no English at all um, and that that basically uses existing infrastructure so I think certainly you know around answer to your question one of the biggest impacts is going to be online mm. and that's happening now the other big impact i think of COVID, of course is going to be about study abroad and student movement um uh, the university sec sector in the uk has you know has taken a large hit as you know um they're just this week they're, they're 13 universities have announced that they're going to go bankrupt yeah it's really not good and that you know i've done a number of projects this summer with universities and they're you know they're pre-sessional courses are a significant part of their income yes and uh, when you're down to 90 percent of what you expected and that's not a thing that's going to go away quickly because again i know that the council in british council in china have been involved in a project uh to to, to do an online pre-sessional with, with some universities there and i wonder what given the, the the economic advantage for students and their families if that goes well whether that's going to be a more and more common model and the, the, this kind of preparatory year or preparatory summer will actually mm. happen more and more at home and the, the amount of time spent in the UK or the US or wherever, or wherever the university destinations will be shorter is, or is happen at the, all. Is this the kind of thing that you mentioned when you, you wrote in your blog that we've, we need to manage the re-engineering and regrowth of our institutions with due consideration mm. to the climate emergency? I mean, the, there's the re-engineering and regrowth of our institutions according to what's, uh, how COVID is restructuring society at the moment. But then you also added the consideration to the climate emergency. What do you mm. mean by that? Well, it seems to me, I mean, I mean don't misunderstand me, COVID is, 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 is a catastrophe, however you look at it, so not just for ELT, but for, for humankind. Um, but it, the fact that we are going to have to somehow re-engineer, restructure, reorganise the way we deliver English language teaching, whether it's, it's in universities in the UK or, or, or private language schools in Japan, it's going to be somehow different. While we're going through that process of re-engineering, adaption, whatever you want to call it, let's have a look at what environmental challenges and, and what environmental issues we can we can seek to balance as we go through that 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 that, that process. I mean, in some ways. Mm -hmm. The reduction in flying, it, 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 it's, it's quite a significant, it, 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 environmentally, it's, it's a really big deal. It's huge. I don't really know, big I, deal. I don't fancy getting on an airplane anytime no. soon. No. <laughs> and I don't know how many students will. I, I, mean, I, 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 I mean, the summer school market in the UK is not in a good way. The universities are not in a good way. There are closures. There have been several closures in the US. I suspect there will be closures in the UK as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that what we're going to be seeing, again, as I mentioned in the blog, more and more of is your private language school in Italy, a private language school in Greece running a, a summer school. You know, traditionally, they probably shut in July and I hope never to see any students again until September. But we'll be running summer schools, possibly on the beach, in the mountains, whatever, to replace the thing that, that the kids would normally have gone to in, in, in the UK or Ireland. Or there could be a boon for local private institutions who take the initiative to do that kind of thing because of the students well, yeah. are not travelling overseas now. I, I, yeah, I see that. Yeah, but, but also, I mean, it's, 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 I'm not sort of... I, I'm, I'm desperately sad, but I think language, school, language teachers in the UK, well, they are and will lose their jobs. And the same in Ireland, the same in Australia. It's yes. going to happen. Well, I mean, it's happening now and it's probably yeah. going to get worse. But what I'd like to see is that language schools in the UK making partnerships with schools in wherever their students typically come from. Um, so if there's a three week summer school in the, the Italian Alps or something, maybe a week of it is provided by the you know, English Can Be Fun School in London or something uh, online or mm. some involvement of the teachers in the UK. I, I think that kind of partnership is, is probably the way forward because I do think, you know, people see the validity of exposure to the UK culture, American culture, Australian culture, and, mm. and, and they're not going to stop wanting that. But they're, they're balancing that against jumping on a plane full of mm. someone who might well have COVID sitting next to you. You might be, well, I don't think I want to do that anymore. 
Um, there, there, there's uh, those, uh, that concept of the, the summer camp is, mm. is quite popular in the States, but also mm, in absolutely, America, yeah. uh, China, uh, sorry, mm. uh, Korea, Japan, mm. Thailand, um, all had mm. massive um, summer camp, mm. um, and especially English summer camp. There you have it. Programs where they had a couple of weeks where they would take all the students away and have all these really fun games and yeah. really nice activities mm. and out discovering nature, doing walks, doing exercise, but mm. doing it in English. All um, of that stuff, yeah. That kind of stuff. That maybe that's it's time. To I think it's going to come up. I think it's, oh, instead yeah. of instead of going to Bournemouth for three weeks, they'll they'll go into the, into yeah. the mountains and um, probably do very similar activities. You know, I mean. And as you say, it's, as far as you can get a bunch of teenagers doing anything 100% in English, um, you know, it will be an English medium environment. And with input from schools in the UK or you know, down in Asia, schools in Australia, you know, w with the cultural input as well, which is part of the deal. If you, can't, if you go to the UK, you go to Ireland, and part of it is being in Cork or it being in Manchester. Um, and I think that's a reality that, that that's kind of in a sense being forced on us but of course there is an environmental environmental benefit i mean the the the, the it's, it's a lot of air miles will we will yeah not be flown no it's just reminded me of uh, in japan there was a, an institution called british hills which was up in the mountains and near tokyo but it was a, a retreat place where the you took a, a group of students and they had it all set up as shops and bars and restaurants and but all they were all staffed by native english speakers Oh, yeah. And it's like going into a, a foreign village, but in Japan. Well, there we are. People, people are going to be reconstructing, you know, the northern, the northern, northern district of Manchester in, in Spain or something. You know, the northern, the northern coast is outside Bilbao in the mountains or something. But I mean, I think, I, I hope that's what we'll see. Um, and, well, I know. I mean, I do our projects and what I mentioned in the blog where, where people are latching onto this and make seeking these partnerships. And um, because I think that. We're going, language schools are going to go. We're, go, we're going to lose a lot of jobs. And that's a great, a mm. great tragedy. And um, even if it's environmental benefit, it's still a great tragedy uh, for, for, for those teachers. And uh, uh, you, you know, as well as I do, summer school in the UK is very much part of an EFL teacher's expectation. I'll come back to the UK for a couple of months in the summer and, and, and go to Hastings or somewhere and, and do, do my summer school. It was also huge uh, supplementary income for a large number of state school teachers who used to mm, do those absolutely. as summer jobs during their Especially holidays uh, to yeah. bump up their salaries. And mm. I've got a couple of friends who, who used to do that. But yeah, it was a massive business and it's just mm. completely disappeared. Yeah, it's not good. But I mean, but th there is an environmental benefit if that makes anyone feel better. So I, I, I think that, 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 that that's the real COVID impact. But um, I put in the blog, I think there's something interesting about, about COVID. Um, well, I hope it is. Uh, I, I'm a fairly sceptical kind of person, but let's assume I'm not for a minute. Um, have we, I'm saying with the California now, have we discovered some synergies, some connection, valuing our neighbors, understanding our communities? getting to know people, being more tolerant of people who not, may not act or look like we do than we were before all this? And that, that's a rhetorical question. I don't know the answer. But assuming we have, might that influence ELT content in some way? It's, well, it's an interesting you, question, uh, isn't it? It's what an interesting are you thinking about what, what might be the kinds of things that might influence ELT content? Tolerance, diversity. You, you, you know, we know, I mean, I worked in publishing, you work with publishers, we know that uh, publishers uh, have to be, or feel they have to be uh, very conservative in, in terms of content because they want to sell it as, uh, to as many countries around the world as they can. We know that, and that's a, an economic reality. But I think some of that conservatism is slightly misplaced. And I have a feeling if attitudes around the world are changing, and I'm not just talking about at all about the UK, I'm talking about most of us have been locked down at various points in the last few months, whether there is more tolerance and understanding. And that can be somehow reflected in what we teach. I don't know. That is a very good question, because again, going back to the, the situation in the States, um, mm. Where international students who are studying online in the US last week mm. were under threat of being thrown out of the country. Uh, yeah, that's so been reversed, hasn't it? Now I think it has been reversed yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. But the, this general lack of tolerance to mm. foreigners or fear of the foreign, um, the, the, the animosity that's building at mm. the moment um, economically to the Chinese mm. 
it, where some people are finding greater tolerance and greater compassion for their neighbours, others are trying to get rid of them. The other, <laughs> sure the the other way. It's a tricky one. I suppose I'm desperately <laughs> casting around for something positive, but I mean, I, 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 I remain very committed to personally and to widening the 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 the, the, the scope of ELT, the, the content. Yeah, uh, and this might I don't know. It's interesting, isn't it? Whether we are going to be a bit more, a bit more liking each other a bit more and a bit more curious mm. about each other in a, in a positive way. Um, I know it's not something we can measure at all. You mentioned before about the, I mean, the first step that you took was um, taking environmental issues into your classroom and getting mm. beach cleanups and mm. things mm. as part mm. of mm. your education mm. experience. Mm. Um, now, the, uh, the environment is a topic that is covered in almost every curriculum that I've ever seen around the mm. world, whether it be at private school or state schools. Mm. Um, the, the, the climate emergency that we have at the moment that's been publicised by Greta Thunberg and, mm. Um, mm. is only going to get worse. I was mm. noticing the other day, um, have you heard about the Thwaite Glacier? No, it's getting worse on all fronts. The Thwaite Glacier is a glacier the size of the UK in Antarctica that's about to drop into the ocean and raise sea level by about one to Gusting. three metres. Absolutely gusty. It is horrific uh, and it's just around the corner. Uh, so something's got to change and I think the nature of what we do within our classes is probably something that needs re-examining as well. Perhaps it's about creating more uh, students that, that have a more active role in society, that are taking a more active part in, in changing uh, what's happening within their local environment. I agree, it's interesting. I mean, ELT is, is uh, it's a remarkable thing really when you think about the global community. I don't mean the teachers or the teacher trainers, I mean the students. I don't know how many million people are studying English in some form at any given moment of the day. Somebody probably someone could work that out. But it's clearly millions. It's an army of people who I'm not saying influence is the wrong word, but by working with those that create materials, those who develop syllabuses, working ministries mm -hmm. of education with inspectors, with teacher trainers, we can try to push environmental issues higher up the agenda but i think the point you make is interesting that that a lot of stuff in course books is are, is very globalized which is no. fine but the problem with that is it's not about me mm -hmm. and i think if people can understand the global impact of it is out there in their backyard it's it's you know i live in central london and i am still horrified when i hear of kids dying of asthma now because they live on that main road down there which happened here here a couple of years ago because it's very local so i think i, I know it's hard for course books to be local by the very definition they have to be global but at least putting in the mechanisms to say okay think about your community mm -hmm. what goes on in your town and it's not just about electric buses or car sharing though that that that, that that's great and i think that a lot of the content is too remote stuff that can be brought down as i said into projects into mm. stuff that you can actually go out and do even if it's if you're in a secondary school making some posters about environmental issues and take them down to the yeah. primary school and saying look guys every week try to do one of these can you walk instead of get the bus one get, get in the car once whatever it is this kinds of stuff yeah. so i think localization is really really important and I'm sure in your travels, you've seen mm. a lot of really good localization projects. I've, I've uh, been amazed by things like um, plastic bottle recycling uh, programs that are running through schools and largely through English classes mm. in, um, in, in West Africa. Uh, a number of um, debating programs in, in <laughs> India and active citizenship um, programs where they, they, the kids are actually running environmental Absolutely. awareness campaigns in their local communities in India, uh, yeah. and Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Um, what, what are some of the examples of great projects that you've seen? Well, something that, that I, actually still in North Africa, you probably know Morocco has, um, has, has made a major uh, commitment to solar power. I, th I think they've got the, some, the largest solar, solar electricity generation sites in the world and they've always got perfect climate for it. it that has become very p much part of the curriculum, something to be proud of something that we're that's doing great. there's something I, 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 a great win and that's why that that that, yeah. that 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 for me is the trick i think for for, for, the, for the student and the teacher in the class to think this is what we're doing mm. 
it's all very well for, to say what's going on in a country which may be much better resolved. Well, they're much richer than we are. Of course, they can do that. Yeah. Um, so it, it's bottom up, I think, but but guided and structured in some way by materials or by teachers or by teacher trainers. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, um, I, I was just thinking it's, it amazes me how few countries are actually using solar panels to um, power schools and local communities. There's so many, so many um, villages out there that don't have much electricity provision, but they, they keep trying to hardwire, waiting for the, the hard wire to come along and connect them to the grid. But actually, mm. solar panels would be a much, in, mm. in most of these countries, would be a much more useful solution. They only need to work during the day. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and if you're in a place with a lot of sun and heat, then Morocco, you're well equipped. I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know, but I assume it's the infrastructure cost of putting them in in the first place. I don't know. Um, but I think it's, it's the individual country decision making issues. Is the, the, there are places like, uh, again, India, Pakistan, where, where that kind of thing is quite widespread. These micro mm. um, solar panels, they, they, they use them in the Middle East to power headlights, uh, to power mm. street lights. That's right. Yeah. You see one of the little panel on top there, yeah. And uh, it's, it's initiatives like that and, and the way they're treated in class and the way they're discussed in class. As I say, we have this, this, this great community of, of, of millions of students around the world over whom we do have influence as teachers. So it's giving teachers the confidence, the frameworks, the materials, access to the materials, the ideas to try these things out. And, and most importantly to, to localize them within their own context. Mm. That's the, the great thing about English language teaching isn't it? It's not just teaching the English language, it's not just the grammar and the vocabulary and Absolutely the um, functions and whatever, it's, it's, you have to teach them communication skills and, and enabling students to be able to talk about topics that are of importance mm. to them and their community. Absolutely, and, and all this collaboration and communication, team working, you know, making a poster about um, sanitation or something like that or or, 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 or way that water can, can be heated by the sun is is is, is a great language project um, but the content is more valuable than the language in my opinion you know, the mm. actual fact that the, these kids might you know think well, why, why do we have one of these um, so I think it's yeah we do have a great opportunity but again it, it's sometimes it's, I mean courseworks as you say have had an, an environment chapter an environment unit for years There's nothing new in that but it tends to be fairly remote I think so it's 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 working with publishers and writers to to and teacher trainers as well people on the ground saying okay this is not interesting unit this but let's have a look what do they do in this town what do they do in your town let's pull it down a bit and giving teachers the confidence the tools to to take the the concept but localize it and, and turn it out into a lesson. I think that's a really important thing to do. Absolutely. So we've got, I think we've talked about that from a, a systemic perspective, from this large scale decision makers making big mm. decisions about how um, things are funded, what kinds of uh, mm. technology can be used to um, supplement teaching and right at the face-to-face the, the, the -face level with students, mm. what activities, mm. what content we can use to, to increase awareness. Is there what other is are there any other implications you think there are for English language teaching from the COVID crisis that might involve an environmental aspect? Well, as I say, I mean the the the, the conference thing is, is is that's going to change. I think the way the way the way that we meet and we we share ideas, um, we're going to have to get used to Zoom conferences, like or loathe. I think that's going going to sit there. Um, I guess one other thing which, which which people don't always think about is is the the buildings, the infrastructure, um, school buildings, basically. Um, mm. I hope that, well, sadly, I suspect some schools will be downsizing, will be changing their number of rooms or, or moving or reconfiguring, reconfiguring the way they work. Schools will certainly be looking to save money, definitely, mm. because, because of the student base will be falling. So hopefully they will go through the opportunity for environmental audits while they do that to look at ways perhaps of uh decreasing the amount they the, the amount of electricity they consume on air conditioning on heating depending on where you live looking at the way electricity is used in, in, in lights looking at insulation um stuff that you actually probably do when you buy a house um mm -hmm. but the idea of the greener school and the, 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 we, we have content on, on the site about the processes that schools can go through this might be an opportunity i say sadly some will be downsizing or or, 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 or shedding rooms or whatever because they haven't they haven't got the student capacity anymore 
Um, but one thing that I find immensely frustrating about this, Alan, actually, that the whole online thing um, is the, environment, the environmental impact of the great servers that store all our data and store all our <laughs> photographs and store all our ebooks. It is not a good thing. Um, I think the Googles and the Microsofts of this world are well aware, um, but they produce masses of heat. They have to be cooled. Um, I live just around the corner from this, the uh, European Service Centre of one of the big international banks, and you can actually feel the heat when you walk past coming out of the vents, and they have steam cooling, they have a chimney on it, and it's just servers. And that's a hidden environmental cost and it's just when you seem to think oh this is great online look at this we're not flying so much uh, hang on a minute now someone's got to do the maths one day and work out you know one ebook or two hours on zoom has this environmental impact that's not going to be made as a calculation but these calculations will have to be done it's becoming a, a, a more and more concerning topic as i say i've read some stuff particularly um well from Google about what they're doing, um, but of course, you know, corporate vim flam is always is always a way of uh, a way of addressing an issue. But there there is a growing awareness of it, and a lot of people don't think of that. There's a there's a big um, feeling that if it's electric, it's clean, but the electricity has to be generated somewhere. And how is that electricity being generated? Absolutely, and servers get very very hot. Mm. They have to be cooled, and that that that's the problem. They're pumping heat out into the atmosphere. Um, yeah. That's often done by chemical exchange as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, a different form of an, 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 another cost. Yeah, so it's not straightforward, and that's one of the things you often sort of think with some light at the end of the tunnel. We're going online; it's going to be, it's going to be a bit better. Oh, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so it's rather depressing, isn't it? But it, it is something that that is going to have to be factored in. But as I say, the the the, the the large server providers have flagged up that we are aware of this, but I mean, who knows what, 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 what how that will develop? And I don't know how these things are measured either. Somebody a lot smarter than me would know how to how that can be measured. I think you just kind of highlighted the the that the the issues we're facing here are complex issues. They're complex mm. problems, and they need complex solutions. And a lot of mm. times, when we listen to politicians or people standing on on platforms talking about stuff. Um, they oversimplify things to a huge mm. extent and make it black and white. And there's no black and white about this. No. There's just there's lots not. and lots of grey that we need to fish through and find out what the connections are between these different things, how they impact on each other, and, and acknowledge that uh, complexity. I agree. And, uh, and I think COVID is an opportunity. It sounds, sounds a slightly um, mm. disrespectful thing to say, perhaps, but it is. The fact that it is, if fewer people are flying and we're going to have to change the way we work, if fewer students are prepared to physically go into class and we've got to change the way we work. Okay, before we jump into doing X, let's just have a little voice in the back of our head that says, wait a minute, environmentally, you could try that way. So at, le at least something good comes of it, of, of all this horrible mess. And uh, as I say, people are going to lose jobs, people are going to lose livelihoods, mm. people are going to lose everything in some cases, and nobody wants that to happen. But in that, it's, 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 it's a movement that's something been forced on us. Let, let's try and make the best of it to, uh, to some, by positive environmental, uh, environmental impacts. Um, but like you say, it ain't, you know, saying that to a teacher in Manchester who lost their job yesterday is saying, well, air's a bit cleaner. I know what he's going to say. He's going to say what I would say if I just lost my job, I think. So, you know, um, there is no way. But all we can do, I suppose, as, as people of some influence in this community, is to spread the word and to do what we're doing now, which is to talk about it. And um, people may agree or disagree profoundly. Fine. But at least we're talking about it, I think. And one, one place to find uh, information on these issues is your website, which I believe is ELT Footprint. Dot org. Dot org. That's us. You will find a bit, a bit about us. You'll find lesson plans, content materials, ideas. Um, you are, and also one or two longer documents, uh, kind of policy type documents. You, you you can have a play with, have a look at. And but it's it's completely uh, crowd supported. So if you have something you would like to post, if you would like to write a blog please approach one of us either through the website or is the messages through, through, through the Facebook page and we will be very happy. We are really looking for stories from the developing world. Mm. Absolutely. Um, because a lot of our stuff is Northern European, US, um, patches in Asia. Um, 
you know, I want a teacher in Namibia to write and say, this is what we've been doing. Because uh, th that's very, very valuable, I think. And, and um, so, you know, if you've got an idea, even if you've never written a blog before, just write and say, I'm not quite sure what to do. We will very happily take people through the process. That's not an issue at all. Um, but we, we, we want to push it south, basically. It's, 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 uh, and get, get ideas like the things that you've mentioned through the stuff that's been going on in India and going on in Asia and, and grab that and, and publicize that. That's really important to us. Great. Well, I think that's been, uh, that's been a really interesting discussion. I hope the, the members of ELTfootprint.org um, will um, like it and um, go and have a look at the other interviews that we've had. And I hope that, um, that our viewers will uh, join up to ELTfootprint.org. Well, they're very welcome. There's always space. Bring, bring ideas, bring lesson plans, bring materials and share. Share away is, is, is the way forwards, I think. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Alan. Cheers. Thanks very much.